respiratory rate increases. Blood is directed into our muscles and limbs. Pupils dilate. Awareness intensifies. Sight sharpens. Impulses quicken. Perception of pain diminishes. Immune system mobilizes with increased activation. We become prepared, physically and psychologically, for fight or flight. This happens every time a police or fireman hears an alarm or is put in harm's way. During this, the heart rate can go from arresting 70 beats per minute to 140 or more beats per minute in a matter of seconds. Right now we're responding to a reported uh, wildland fire. It's actually in uh, Reno Fires District. We're gonna go mutual aid. We always go auto, automatic aid for anything in the Reno area. It's kind of in our area. Ends up five stories. Friends and neighbors, helping neighbors and friends. You can cancel. This is a controlled burn. You can cancel. So it's kind of a controlled burn, so now you're going to cancel everybody. Fight or flight response happens Our even when the call canceled. gets canceled. Copy. Ends up five, 1028. This is our logbook. So each one of these red things is a call. For us, like this is a lot yesterday, um, this is 8 o'clock at night, and so they went out, you know, between 8 and, and 10, three or four times, but after 10 o'clock when normal people are sleeping, they went out at 10.20, uh, 10.48, 10.56, 11.15, 1, you know, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 5.15, 6.45, and 6.55. I can give you a to-go bottle. Fight or flight response happens even when it's during dinner. We're like Pavlov's dogs. The beeper goes off and our body starts preparing for action. Some of our old guys told me when I hired, no, that alarm doesn't, it doesn't affect me anymore. We're so used to it, we don't realize it's affecting us. But when we put the monitoring uh, devices on, we see physiological changes that are represented by an increase in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate. Of, of doing this job, waking up in the middle of the night, lack of sleep, uh, maybe a lack of nutrition, um, lack of, of eating habits, because you can't, it's not a regular nine to five job where, you know, we eat breakfast at eight, we eat lunch at 12, and we eat dinner at six. Well, sometimes we, we don't get to eat breakfast. Uh, sometimes there's been times that it's been three o'clock and I haven't eaten anything all day because you're running calls, you're, doing, you're busy. So years and years and years of, of uh, Stress like that put, puts a toll on you. Fortunately, uh, we, we do have annual physicals that we have to go to, and we do blood work, we do cholesterol, so a lot of those we could find precursors, yeah, precursors of, of any medical problems that, that could hurt us down the road. We're all having financial challenges in our departments, but the one thing that you can do uh, to manage a, a unfunded liability like heart and lung benefits or a member's disease is by doing prevention, early detection. And the only way that's gonna happen is by doing yearly physicals. Every year, our law enforcement officers and firefighters die needlessly or are disabled from strokes, heart attacks, or some form of cardiovascular disease. The U.S. healthcare system has fallen short of preventing these needless and costly deaths. Prevention starts with identifying who is at risk before a heart attack occurs. In 2001, Specialty Health was approached by the risk manager for the University of Nevada. He needed help stopping the unnecessary deaths and disabilities occurring within his police departments. Under the heart-lung veil in Nevada and in many other states, it is presumed that if a sworn officer has an event, um, a heart-lung problem, that it gets paid for under workers' compensation. So it becomes our responsibility to manage that risk at that point. That's how we, as a workers' compensation musculoskeletal-based company, got connected with wellness and prevention 
and uh, the annual physical that the officer had to have every year in reviewing those. By 2006, Specialty Health had reviewed thousands of annual police and fire physicals. What they found shocked them. Many, many untreated and undiagnosed young men and women with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and cholesterol problems. Walking time bombs. We Absolutely. saw people dying, young men dying of heart attacks and having strokes, and uh, it was for unnecessary reasons. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the nation and has been since the beginning of the century. An estimated 935,000 heart attacks occur each year. 50% of the time, the first warning sign is death. We're looking at great pockets of research being done on cancer and, and um, cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's, and they're all compartmentalized. They all have their own silos of information. The country has so been focused on cholesterol or high LDL cholesterol as the cause of heart disease. And this has been, I truly think, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but certainly catered to by the enormous efforts that pharmaceutical companies that have drugs that lower cholesterol have advertisements on the radio and the television, whatever. Uh, they sponsor a lot of the education that physicians get in this country. What happens is that there's no practical application. There may be a statin you can throw at it, but no one quite on the, on the practical side of the primary care doctor or even a cardiologist understand how to treat uh, the problem. Death rates alone cannot describe the burden of heart disease and stroke. In 2010, the cost was a staggering $503 billion in health care expenditures and lost productivity from deaths and disability. So there's a huge gap between research and practical application right. for, for a population of people. Ten years later, what we know is that treatment as usual may get you killed. You must be able to identify someone at risk before the onset of cardiovascular disease. Today, the Cardiac Wellness Program has diagnosed and treated thousands of young men and women who protect us 24 hours a day. Specialty Health believes they have saved lives and provided patients with a better quality of life through a constant search for better ways to prevent cardiovascular disease. Do you know whether you are at risk? We gathered five very different case studies who have five very different sets of cardiovascular risk factors. See who you identify with. Here with uh, Mike Hernandez, who's the uh, chief of fire here at Reno. Mike, uh, just uh, you're, you're, you're to watch. It's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you, doctor. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So we take your physical, and we look at it every which way we can. Uh, we look at it four different ways. Medical information can often be confusing. That's why Specialty Health developed the Big Five chart, or the red light, green light chart, a way patients could easily understand when they are at risk for cardiovascular and related diseases. Everybody in public safety understands what a red light means and what a yellow light means, what a green light means. And so over time, we evolved to four sets of data. On the upper part of the graph here, where you see the yellow and green lights, um, those yellow and green lights reflect what public health talks about as the big five. The weight issues, the blood pressure issues, the smoking issues, the lipid issues here, and sugar here. And then we total up uh, those lights over on the far column uh, in red, yellow, and green. It includes a Framingham risk score that predicts a 10-year risk of a heart attack. This is used by many practitioners. Framingham is interesting. It's, it's very statistically accurate to give you the risk of having a heart attack within the next 10 years. Framingham is heavily age-related, and Framingham missed some things that we thought were important. Age-related um, being the younger you are, the, the less at are, risk the you're, less going likely to appear. you're going to have a heart attack in the, in the next 10 years, no matter how bad you are. Well, that wasn't what we were looking for. We were looking for the young guy 
who is going to surprise us. Red means we've got a problem. Green and yellow, uh, less so. Green, of course, is, is what we're looking for. Uh, and on your physical, um, we knew you'd have, we knew you'd have a, a red light under BMI. Your BMI that we, uh, we calculated was 32.6. Um, I think BMI in police and firefighters on an individual level can be extremely misleading. We've seen guys with BMIs of 32 with essentially no body fat. What's your ideal weight? We don't know that until we weigh you underwater. And that's hmm. one of the things we're going to want to do with you. Your blood pressure is great, 108 over 76, that's just great. Uh, tobacco, you've never used tobacco, don't smoke, great. The only number you have for metabolic syndrome is, uh, is the uh, weight issue or the waist issue. What I see here is a really nice physical and the problems, sometimes we see multiple problems that we have to deal with and sort out, that's not the case with you. Being of Hispanic heritage, having parents that were both, you know, type two diabetics, uh, you know, both uh, my father had, you know, coronary artery disease. Uh, I mean, all the cards were stacked against me, so mm -hmm. I was already, you know, when, when, when I read the, the, the handouts that you gave me, I was deeply concerned because, you know, high stress job, poor eating habits, overweight, parents, history, genetics. I mean, uh, I was going to rush out and, you know, hit the Mutual of Omaha people for more insurance. <laughs> One of the major things we look for when we uh, do your physical and analyze the data is insulin resistance. We think that is the critical, critical starting point. Insulin resistance, although unknown by many physicians today, was first discovered by Stanford endocrinologist Dr. Gerald Reven in 1981. Technically, in insulin sensitive or normally functioning individuals, insulin does its job of transporting glucose into cells properly. In insulin resistant individuals, the cells in your body don't respond properly to insulin's call to accept glucose or sugar from the blood into your fat or muscle cells. In response to this malfunction, the pancreas secretes more and more insulin into the bloodstream. In insulin-resistant individuals, fat gets trapped in the fat cells and can't be used properly for energy, so the fat cells just keep getting fatter. Due to a combination of genetics and lifestyle, many of us are insulin-resistant the estimate is 30% of the American population. That is, certain cells in our body don't respond efficiently to insulin's call to accept glucose from the blood, particularly fat, liver, and muscle. Our pancreas then pumps out extra insulin to correct this problem. When you're insulin resistant, your blood sugar levels go up slightly, and your blood insulin levels go up dramatically. The best way to solve this problem is to attack it at its root, that is, to keep the insulin levels under control. The concept is so important because if we identify those who are insulin resistant, which we can with a simple calculation, we can predict who will have cardiovascular disease 20 years before onset. That is prevention. And since there has not been an obvious drug to treat insulin resistance that I think has got a lot less attention, it's also a little more complicated. And therefore, it requires more education. And, well, not that much more, but it's a little more complicated than simply high LDL, cholesterol means more heart disease. And it's not been necessarily a major goal of anybody in this country. Uh, any of the associations have not focused on it that much. So for a combination of a lot of reasons, it tends to be overlooked. And that's what I thought I was going to see with you because you had gained the weight. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to tell you <laughs> that I don't see that at all. Well, and I'm happy to hear, <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Mike's insulin resistance score is 1.1. A score of 3.5 or higher would put him at risk. I'm actually going to incorporate a, a three-day a week uh, physical fitness program. Hopefully we can get uh, all my lights green on my chart. And hopefully in three months when we visit again, um, we'll have something, something positive to look at and talk. And ultimately that's, that's the goal of any fire chief, any police chief, any type of uh, leader of an organization to, to set the example 
and to make sure that we can get as many participants as we can into a or, or, uh, program like this. The thing that we are concerned about with Mike is not only is he a little bit overweight, um, he has a family history of diabetes and heart disease. And so with a person like this, even though he's not insulin resistant, he doesn't have metabolic syndrome, and he only has one red light, we would really want to look at him just a little bit further and see what's going on with his LDL particles. When we look at the risk factors this way, we can put the Framingham, the, uh, Framingham risk score, the ATP3 risk score, the metabolic risk score, the insulin resistance score, and we can look at advanced testing, and we can look at them all together. Most people that are evaluating cardiovascular risk today would look at the Framingham score and the ATP3 score, and they would put Mike at low risk. The point in looking at this is that Mike shows that he is not at risk based on routine testing. He's at moderate risk with his small particle LDLPs. Um, and so we will want to watch him and hope that the lifestyle changes will change that. Mike would not have known he was at risk from a routine physical. You can't always rely on routine testing to identify your cardiovascular risk factors. One of the problems with wellness programs is that you, plans tend to couple them with disease management programs. So you identify the ones that are already sick and you try to manage them and get them to a better place and reduce their risks. What we tend to ignore, because they don't cost us a lot of money right now, are the low risk ones. And we need to keep them at the low risk level. So we need to be talking with them early on about their identifying potential risks and keeping all those green lights and not let them advance into the yellows and certainly not the reds because once you do that, you're back in a disease management state. For me, I, like, I wouldn't go to the doctor. Like, I'm 28, I'm like, I have no, I don't no feel bad, so why would I go to the doctor? Wellness is really, to me, critical for the young employees and for the people who look perfectly healthy and who have what traditionally we would be considered absolutely no risk according to their uh, lipid panels, their profiles. And that means a tremendous amount of education. We all have two different kinds of cholesterol, HDL, which is known as good cholesterol, and LDL, known as bad cholesterol. LDL stands for low-density lipoprotein. The lipoproteins are extremely tiny. They're measured in terms of a millionth, a millionth of a meter. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're just extremely tiny. And among the lipoproteins, there's variability in their size. There are two kinds of LDL particles that we all have, small and dense, which are the dangerous kind called pattern B, or large and fluffy called pattern A. In the insulin resistance syndrome, there's a large number of small, dense LDL particles. Now, Jackie, I'm gonna give you 16 marbles. This is a typical cat's eye marble, and this is a ping pong ball. And we're gonna put this in this hand, and the 16 marbles in this hand. If this ping pong ball was totally filled up with cholesterol, and these 16 marbles were totally filled up with cholesterol, do you have more cholesterol in this hand with the 16 marbles, or this hand with the ping pong ball? Well, obviously, look at this hand. I could never stuff all these 16 marbles into this big ball. Into this ping pong ball. That's the answer everybody gives us. This is a trick question. The answer is you have just as much cholesterol in this hand as this hand. Which one is the dangerous cholesterol? This is the dangerous cholesterol. The cardiologists call the small, dense, and dangerous particles pattern B. Those particles can actually work their way through the cell wall um, into the area just underneath the intima of the artery and form plaque, which ultimately gets bigger. And here, ruptures, that's a heart attack, forms a clot, occludes the artery, and uh, unfortunately many times kills your patient. Small, dense, and dangerous, large, fluffy, and buoyant. We want all our police officers and firefighters 
to be large, fluffy, and buoyant. Knowing your particle number and size is so important, but routine tests don't measure it. Remember, the small, dense particles are dangerous. The case of late journalist Tim Russert shows why advanced testing is important. Sudden heart attack killed Russert at age 58. Russert had normal cholesterol levels in routine testing, but autopsy showed he had advanced heart disease. You can't always rely on routine testing to identify your cardiovascular risk factors. Treatment as usual will get you killed. You've got to look much more deeply. As good as this is, and it's very popular among our physicians, it isn't enough oftentimes to let you know what risk you're truly facing. Um, what we most frequently do is an advanced test called the NMR. The NMR is a magnetic resonance scan of your blood. That's an incredibly important test because it gives us particles. It gives us the particle number. It lets us know what particles, how many big particles there are, how many small particles there are. And another beautiful thing that this test does is it gives us a second look at insulin resistance. When we give our presentation to uh, large groups of uh, police officers or firefighters, we encourage them to bring their lab to the presentation because what I want them to do is look at their triglyceride level, look at their HDL level, and I want them to do the calculation. If the ratio of triglyceride to HDL is 3.5 or greater, then we're really concerned about insulin resistance. And what I do, if I see that on routine testing, I look for a reason to order the NMR because the NMR adds so much more information to the routine testing. Mike is overweight, nearing obesity. Over two-thirds of American adults are overweight or obese. On an average, people who are considered obese pay 42% more in health care costs than a normal weight person. Obesity can lead to other health problems. The health risks associated with obesity and being overweight are astounding. They include type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure or hypertension, high cholesterol, stroke, heart attack, congestive heart failure, cancers of the colon, prostate, rectum, uterus, gallbladder, and breast, gallstones, gout and gouty arthritis, osteoarthritis, and many others. If you look at your numbers, what you can see is um, your total cholesterol came back at 204. He's a guy that actually is not um, tremendously overweight. He, his weight is relatively normal, but, but he has a number of other risk factors that really we think will substantially increase his risk of future heart disease. So your blood sugar was high and it would be considered pre-diabetic. I'm worried about him becoming a diabetic in the near future. Um, the way that his blood sugar has increased each physical over the last few years really makes me concerned. And it's, it's something that we see fairly often is that the blood sugar gradually creeps up until one day you're like, what happened? We've lost the battle. Well, we don't have to if we can recognize that early and, and make the appropriate steps in terms of a lifestyle, um, reduce the refined carbohydrates, get the exercise going, we can change his blood sugar and his cholesterol. It's become part of my, my daily routine. I mean, if I, if I don't smoke, uh, you know, I start getting cravings and I get hungry and I get irritable and, you know, everything. If I don't wake up and have a cigarette in the morning, then, you know, I, my whole day is different. But why should I quit smoking at this point in the game? It's been so, you know, 25 years I've been smoking and does it, does it help? Would it help me to stop at this point? Right. In short, yes, it would. A lot. In some people's eyes, the single most important thing that someone can do to reduce the risk of future heart disease is stopping smoking. My grandparents both smoked, and uh, I lost them both to smoking-related diseases. And I swore to myself I'd never be a smoker, but it was just something that was part of our family, and I started doing it, and I never stopped. Smoking, that's a big one, huge one. 
and physicians are taught they should be asking about that every visit because if we can get people to stop smoking, that'll have actually a tremendous influence on his other risk factors. Smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. Smoking and associated diseases decrease the lifespan of men by 13.2 years and women by 14.5 years. Smoking is hard on the heart. There's no question quitting would benefit anyone greatly, but quitting smoking is difficult. Research shows it takes a team. If you're part of a team, if you've got people committed, it makes a difference. And we know that you're taking medications for your blood pressure. I don't like this. I'm sure you don't. Not many people do. I just don't feel yeah. like myself with them. and I'd like to not take them if I didn't have to. Is there any way I can get off those medications? Or are there any alternative treatments for those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Greg has high blood pressure, medically defined as hypertension. He's on medications for his blood pressure. Hypertension is called the silent killer, the number one cause of stroke, which is the number three cause of death in the U.S. Regular consistent exercise lowers blood pressure as much, if not more, than a medication. Dietary changes also reduce blood pressure. So there are things that you can do to reduce your blood pressure. But you got to do them, right? Right. Tell me about your exercise. Well, you know, my job's a little bit physical, so that's what I consider my exercise. And other than that, just, you know, fishing on the weekends, that sort of stuff. That's not giving us the, that's not giving the hard exercise. I know it's work and it counts as physical activity, but when we talk about exercise, we want to get someone exercising in such a way that it gets their heart elevated and keeps it elevated. The heart's a muscle just like any other muscle, and if, if we want to get it stronger, We've got to get that exercise going, and I think it's important to have someone use the type of exercise that they're comfortable with. Greg is extremely interesting. I think what concerns us most here in, in that his blood sugar is 110, and so he very much is uh, pre-diabetic at this point, and will probably get diabetes within a short amount of time. When you take a look and you look at the risk factors across the board and you look at Framingham, he was at 8%, which is still considered low if you look at Framingham alone. If you look at Framingham and ATP3, it is a 1. So you could possibly miss something on an individual like this unless you took a little bit deeper look and looked at his anaerobic threshold and then looked at his blood sugar and uh, did some more testing. We are treating him with um, exercise and uh, we're going to put him on a non-smoking program, smoking cessation program, and we're going to treat him with um, diet changes. And hopefully that blood pressure will go down. I'm Tamara Lopes. I'm the Division Chief with Reno Fire Department. I'm in charge of the Safety, Health and Training Division and the EMS Division. The catecholamines that we, um, as firemen and policemen, uh, know a lot about, or our bodies know a lot about, because we tend to produce those adrenal hormones often. Um, earlier we heard that uh, police car go by, um, lights and siren code 3. And my body responded to that. My heart rate went up. Uh, I started producing those adrenal hormones, getting ready to function. Um, because we do that so often throughout a day, without a way to mitigate those hormones, they just recirculate in our body, which causes disease. Exercise is the one thing that we can do to help mitigate some of the harmful effects of catecholamines or stress hormones as strong as our weakest link. When, when we go into a structure fire, if one guy goes down, then we're, we're, both going, we're both going down. It really affects not only yourself as an individual, but your whole crew. Only 31% of U.S. adults report they engage in regular physical activity. About 40% report no physical activity. Fitness is a huge cardiovascular risk factor. My name is Rob Knatzer. Uh, I'm a certified athletic trainer and a certified strength and conditioning specialist. 
The actual uh, mask is it's called a direct gas exchange. So we are measuring all the oxygen that they take into their body and the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced as they breathe out. It is very effective in determining their, where they go anaerobic. The main point of the test really is the education for our police and fire. Some of them may think they're in a lot better shape than they are. They may think that their heart rate has the ability to get up to where uh, other people in their age group are getting, and, and it may be 15, 20% below that. You know, a lot of times they'll work out, but they never get into those upper heart rate zones that they need to get into that they will see when they're at work. Having the ability to get their heart rate up into a level that it should be able to get to, and then the ability to recover right afterwards is one of the biggest implications of how that heart does. And so it's nice to show them that they have the ability to get there and that they need to get there. That's part of their training routine. People may kind of fall through the cracks as they go, and so we're trying to catch them or, or stop that from happening. Hopefully prevent them from getting injured in the first place. Hopefully seeing something with our police and fire that uh, maybe they wouldn't see on just a routine physical exam. We're seeing some things here from an exercise standpoint that may cue us into what's going on with their blood work and may help them incorporate a few things that changes everything in a year or two. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and I will take that to the grave because I really think if I spend a couple hours with somebody doing some injury prevention stuff that that's going to save me 10 hours with them down the road. I really feel that um, uh, exercise is the great regulator. We see kids all the time that can't can't do basic things and they sit on their butts all day long and now all of a sudden they're eating garbage and now all of a sudden they're overweight and then they don't want to move. We've just created this lazy society from the get-go and we've got to go back to some very easy fundamentals and implement those in early and create a habit and a lifestyle that's going to prevent the problems that we're seeing. Chief Hernandez has scheduled sessions with nutritionist Karen Bain and exercise physiologist Bill Land, who can help him improve his risk factors. Bill and Karen have been looking over Mike's chart prior to seeing him. In 10 days, Mike has already lost 8 pounds. I was given a book to read about the diet and what causes people to be obese. And um, because of that, I, I pretty much modified my, my diet, uh, started watching portion size, and... Um, uh, restricted my, my carbohydrates and of course my sugars and in about 10 days I've managed to drop about eight, eight pounds, eight to, eight to ten pounds give or take a little bit. Once I decided this is what I wanted to do and I set my mind uh, as a goal it was relatively easy. My name is Karen Bain and I'm a registered dietitian and I am also a certified health and wellness coach. I am the dietitian that um, sees all of the clients who come through our program um, through the fire and the police and work with them individually. I meet them where they're at and that's the bottom line for lifestyle change. What influences their eating behaviors? I'm in a high stress job. Uh, I don't eat regularly and typically it um, when I when I do have a home cooked meal it's um, something something short short and fast. As a health and wellness coach, I'm going to really let the client lead. I'm not giving them a diet. I'm not telling them the do's and don'ts. I'm guiding them. Give me your wellness vision. And it's a simple, I want to what? So that I can what? You know, think long term wise. Uh, my vision statement is, is pretty simple. I'd like to get down to my optimal weight and incorporate an exercise program that, that is functional within my current work schedule. Lifestyle change can diet. be small steps, it could be large steps, but steps over time add up to big changes. Coaching them along is um, something that's a new theory in the clinical dietetics arena, but it's something that works and we want to help them drive themselves to wellness. Um, education is critical. As they understand how and why, it makes it a lot easier for them to move forward in their wellness. I felt that Mike was uh, ready, ready for change. He has already made significant um, 
changes from his previous eating lifestyle of eating out a lot. So I think that um, keeping this momentum and motivation will be really important for him. My name is Bill Land and I'm an exercise physiologist uh, and that's someone who studies the acute and chronic effects of exercise uh, on individuals and their health status. Typically physicians tell people to go exercise or go on a diet but they don't give them very specific information and that's the number one complaint from patients uh, nationally as well as locally the feedback we get is that you know people have told them to do it in the past but they just don't get the specifics or the tools that enable them to achieve any success. The nutritionist uh, and I are really careful about individualizing the program to what the patient is interested in doing and if they're ready to do it. Psychologically they they may have a mild interest but they haven't started the plan yet so we try to find out where in that in that curve they are. Muscle, organ, skin. And a lot of these guys think they need to really work it hard every day to get a benefit and that's not quite true. It's the volume of activity that they do over time, the total amount of activity they do and quality is important but not in every workout. So as long as you get say one quality day a week that's all you need to do. Even if you are generally fit, if you spend a lot of time at a desk or a computer or t watching TV that inactivity is a risk factor also. We're gonna uh, do uh, skin fold measurements and ascertain what his uh, body composition is in terms of lean mass and fat weight. And we're going to try to use those test results to write an exercise program for him, a plan, and also an exercise prescription. Well, Mike is uh, pretty typical of what we get with fire and policemen. Big guys, they, they have a lot of muscle mass, so they can, they can weigh a little bit more, and they're often relieved to find out that their weight goal uh, is not as drastic as, as something we come up with. And the real goal on recheck is to make sure that while he's losing weight, he's not losing the lean mass, the, the muscle mass. And that can happen if you go on a, a caloric restricted diet uh, and you lose weight with diet as opposed to exercise. So that's why it's important to continue to exercise, moderately cut your intake, and do some resistance training to help preserve that lean body mass. His LDL cholesterol is a little elevated, that's the bad cholesterol. His particle numbers are a little higher than we like. He's got too many of the small particles, which are the dangerous particles that form the plaque. And so two things that'll change that are diet and exercise. And what that does is it takes that small, dense particle that's dangerous and makes it larger and fluffier. So weight loss and exercise both can, can change lipids some. And you usually have to give that process anywhere from, say, 10 to 12 weeks. If he's, if he's vigilant, he should get a good change. And if he's not going to get a change in that period of time, he maybe have to go on some medication for the, for the cholesterol. He does have a gym at his apartment complex where he can work out. I recommended home weights in case he doesn't want to waste a lot of time in the gym. He seems to be motivated, and he has a kind of driven personality that uh, if he's got concrete goals and he's got a... Uh, come back and check in with somebody, he's much more likely to stay compliant. So I think uh, I think he's going to achieve some success here. I've had a couple of, of temptations, if you will. You know, you, you drive by a billboard and you see a big juicy hamburger advertised and, and uh, two miles away is a, is a burger place. And, and um, it, it's tempting to want to pull in there and, and um, kind of fall off the diet, if you will. But um, I'm pretty focused at, at uh, reducing my overall weight and getting in better shape, so it's keeping me on track. I've set my goals, and we, we can revisit that question in 30 to 60 days. Cool. I'm Todd Renwick, commander with the University of Nevada Reno Police Department. I've been in law enforcement for coming up on 19 years. I've been in uh, the administration uh, piece of it since 1999. Before that, I worked out on the street as a patrol officer and as a supervisor. About six years ago, uh, Dr. Greenwald contacted us, um, got a hold of me, and wanted to uh, talk about a cardiac wellness program for law enforcement officers. I was uh, in, in the process of training for a marathon uh, during all this and uh, getting ready to go back and attend the FBI Academy uh, in Quantico, Virginia. Um, and I got a phone call from, from Dr. Greenwald about my lipids and uh, he said uh, he had some concerns and uh, definitely wanted to talk to me about it. And uh, it was quite the shock. 
when you see that, that you're internally unhealthy, but you've been doing uh, what you think all the right things by maintaining exercise and a fairly, a fairly decent diet. Uh, you know, I'll admit my diet um, isn't always great. Um, but when you learn that uh, potentially you're at risk for heart, di heart disease, it's an eye-opener and it's scary. Todd's situation is similar to that of well-known marathoner Jim Fix. Fix was considered the godfather of modern fitness until he fell to his sudden death at age 52 while running. After he died at an unnecessarily early age, autopsies found that all three of his coronary arteries were damaged by arterial sclerosis. Fix, who ran 10 miles a day, of all people, was considered fit. Just because you were physically fit doesn't mean you aren't at risk. Genetics plays a huge role in determining cardiovascular risk. We've come a long way in cardiac research since Fix died in 1984. Now we have advanced testing and cholesterol medications. When I began a program with Dr. Greenwald and started taking the lipids and uh, went back and saw that my cholesterol points almost dropped uh, uh, 100 points, it was uh, jaw dropping. That really that was um, one of the only uh, major things I had to do in my life and that was uh, look at taking some medication. We didn't know about insulin resistance in 2005 when we first saw Todd. Retrospective calculations show that Todd had an insulin resistance score of 7.29, which is high. Sometimes you may not completely understand it, but just the term insulin resistant um, kind of makes you think that it has something to do with diabetes and um, that your, your body um, isn't processing uh, sugars or insulin the right way and uh, it can turn around and uh, be detrimental to you. Um, it's scary. Again, what is insulin resistance? Dr. Gerald Reven, who discovered insulin resistance, is considered the foremost authority on the subject. The major job that insulin has is to promote or facilitate the disposal of carbohydrate in a form of glucose into muscle cells particularly. The muscle cells differ a good deal as to how sensitive they are to this action of insulin. So if the muscle cell is resistant to this action of insulin, there is an likelihood that the glucose in the blood might go up and in order to prevent that the pancreas then will put out more insulin and it will do its best to put out as much insulin as it has to put out in order to make sure that the glucose uptake by the muscle cells is normal. Now the problem with this is that yes, by secreting more insulin, the pancreas is able to prevent a high blood glucose or diabetes, but unfortunately the high insulin can act on other organs in the body to lead to events which are not good for us, but if anything can end up make, making more likely that certain diseases will happen. So insulin resistance is the common thread not only for diabetes, but for heart attack, for stroke, for many blood pressure problems, on and on and on, polycystic ovarian disease, sleep apnea, insulin resistance breast is a common cancer. thread, breast cancer, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. It's the common Macular thread. It's insulin resistance is to us now the unified field theory of primary prevention. That's the thing you need to be looking for, that's the thing you need to identify, and that's the thing you need to be treating. If we identify those who are insulin resistant, which we can with a simple calculation, we can predict who will have cardiovascular disease 20 years before onset. That is prevention. Not only is it, I think, pr uh, very powerful in its ability to lead to a series of adverse clinical syndromes, it also, among the things we can deal with, is most within our control. So, for example, the country has focused for years on having a high LDL cholesterol as causing heart disease. 
And it does, there's no question about that. But most of the regulatory effects are genetic. So your ability to modify your LDL cholesterol concentration other than by having chosen different parents by diet and lifestyle is relatively marginal. Your ability to improve insulin resistance by lifestyle changes, exercise and diet is profound. Known that it's reversible and that you can uh, treat it and maintain it through either diet, uh, exercise or even possible medication does help. But <clears throat> there's always that thing in the back of your mind that says this is a long-term thing that I have to commit commit to uh, in order to uh, stay healthy and live, live a, a long life. Todd Renwick is the thin, very fit guy that is genetically predisposed to have insulin resistance. This is the Jim Fixes of the world. He had a 7.3 insulin resistance score. So when we look at all of the scores together, he was at 4% Framingham, which is very low risk. So no one would have known if you just looked at Framingham that he was at risk at all. And looking at his ATP3 Framingham score, it was one. And so they would not have known uh, that he was at risk looking at that. But when you start looking at his insulin resistance score of 7.29, he's very at risk. His insulin resistance is starting to go down. His small dense LDLs are um, improving. Um, that's medication, diet, and, uh, and he's continually been fit and exercises. But he's genetically predisposed, so he really, he was put on medications for that reason. If you can't predict it, you can't prevent it. And that's what this is all about. It's taking an insulin resistance score that, that most people don't know or don't look at, uh, although it's an easy calculation off of a routine um, test. Insulin resistance, we now feel, and so do many others, is the number one public health problem facing our country. We've told you how to calculate it. We've told you how we, how we define it in two different ways. Once we make the diagnosis, there's four things we do. The first thing we do is put the patient on a low carbohydrate diet. With a low carbohydrate diet, what we'll see is a drop in the triglycerides and a, ra and, and a rise in the HDL by routine testing. The second thing we do is make sure that the patient's on, an, on a uh, exercise program. With exercise, we know that insulin sensitivity can improve dramatically. The third thing we want to do is get the patient to lose some weight if weight is an issue. If a patient, who, if a patient who's overweight can lose 5% of their body weight, the entire metabolic picture can change dramatically. The fourth thing we do is we occasionally use diabetic medications like metformin. Metformin is an incredibly in interesting uh, medication that improves insulin sensitivity. And on metformin, sometimes the patients will lose weight. All very simple, all very basic, and all very cheap. The question is, does it work? It works spectacularly well. The results we've seen in the city of Reno, high-risk fire and police group have been astounding with those four simple interventions. Todd is insulin resistant. Todd thought that his active lifestyle meant he should be eating lots of carbs. Like most of us, Todd has been misinformed. More and more evidence suggests that sugar and processed foods are toxic carbs. The science is so very clear, sugar and the carbohydrates that form sugar in your body, quickly, those high glycemic index things, are killing us. They're, they're simply killing us. We have another handout called the Gary Tobbs Message that we selected from um, his book. Uh, we recommend the book, but the, but the elements of the message are that carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. That's the secret. 
That's the Gary Tobbs message. We don't get fat because we overeat. We get fat because the carbohydrates in our diet make us fat. That's called the high, that's called the carbohydrate hypothesis, and uh, we subscribe to that. But not in all people. Uh, not all people get fat. Right. So, and so some people are so insulin resistant. Some people can, thin. Some people can be insulin resistant and uh, and thin. Yeah. There's so much bull out there to read about diet and nutrition, and so little of it's backed up by good science. And this stuff is, and, and that's what's really critical to me. The, the important part about this is that all of this stuff on the Big Five chart is evidence-based. The important part about the NMR is that it's evidence-based. Three weeks after committing to the program, we follow up with Mike Hernandez, who is here for an underwater weight test. So the problem, the problem with um, us weighing you, it, it, it doesn't tell us anything about your body composition, which, ha which is how many pounds of fat you have versus how many pounds of bone and muscle. So the only way that we can figure that out is by weighing you underwater. So bone and muscle is going to sink and fat's going to float. So the heavier you are underwater, the better your test is going to be. So let's, let's move over to the body fat tank. Go ahead and step into the pool. So what you want to try to do with this test is blow out the air and put your rump right on the bottom of the pool. So as you blow out, boom, 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 you're going to feel yourself sink, sink, sink. That's 1.1 kilo. Good job. Climb on out. So let's go plug them into the computer. Now we took the water temperature. The water temperature is 88 degrees. So that, the warmer the water, the heavier he'll weigh underwater. So it changes the formula. You gotta make sure you know the temperature. BMI, BMI is, is a nice convenient way that you could screen masses of people with a simple equation. The problem is, is that we're not all built the same. Some people are skinny ectomorphs, some people are fat, endomorphs, and some people are very muscular. So the, the BMI doesn't take into consideration body type. So the, a heavily muscled individual can easily be punished because of their height is their limiting factor. So if you have a 5 foot 10 uh, male who's heavily muscled, they, they may uh, uh, score poorly on the BMI index just because they're big guys. Um, it, it's a great screening tool, but it should be only the beginning. Uh, and then if, if you have people um, that, uh, you know, score higher on the BMI index, you should do a body composition evaluation before you try to let them know that, you know, that they have an obesity problem. Because that's, that, that's a sensitive issue. And you want to keep the program positive. I've lost about 15 pounds from uh, when I initially started the program. Uh, I don't feel weak. Uh, my energy level seems to be a little better. I'm sleeping better at night, so it's, it's good. The challenge is, of course, finding the time to do the exercise component to uh, actually you know, carve out an hour or 60 minutes to do your exercise. What we do is different, and many times it's different because at the end of that day, the decisions you make are about life and death. We work 24-7. We don't turn the lights off at 5 o'clock. Those men and women are on the street 24-7, all right? You leave the briefing room, and really your, your, your working heart rate, your heart rate right there is, is at 100. Being a, a street patrol officer is you're, you're always trying to um, be in the know, see, be aware of what's going on in your surroundings. It can consume you, it can consume your life, it can consume your day. That's just a constant mindset that uh, unfortunately we have to develop in our job to um, be safe. They're rolling to a call at 120 or 130. I think police officers take that stuff for granted. It's not something you're aware of, you just get used to it. 
the emotional side and the wellness side of it for for family life is tough. With shift work, uh, the work is very dangerous. Uh, in the last year, we've seen a 40, 45 percent increase in killings of police officers compared to the last five years. When we go to work, it's not because someone's having a good day. We're not busy all the time, so it's, there's nights that we sleep all night. There's other nights where we're up. Uh, last night, uh, we were up all night, so running calls. So today, you know, probably this afternoon, we're going to be a little tired. 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, and then you get four days off. And you can't just go home and go to sleep because it throws your whole thing off. Then you can't sleep that night. It's hard because you, you get a call and your heart rate goes up, and by the time you get cleaned up, relaxed enough to go back to sleep, you usually get another call. I don't sleep well at the station at all. And we know that when patients are sleep deprived, adults and children, they crave carbohydrates the next day. A recent study, beautiful study, showed that patients in a randomized controlled trial, if you took young healthy people, deprived them of sleep just four hours a night and versus controls, they had the group that was allowed, they were both allowed to eat whatever they wanted, this group, who was sleep deprived ate 300 calories more per day on average. So when you're tired or fatigued, your body and your brain sends out a signal to mobilize and create more glucose and take in more glucose. So you crave carbohydrates, you crave comfort food, mac and cheese, mashed potatoes, these are the things you want when you're tired and miserable. And those are the things that give you a quick fix or quick energy, but of course they raise insulin levels, they raise blood sugar levels, and then they fade very quickly because they have a very high glycemic index. And then two hours later, four hours later, you're hungry again. And so you keep overeating. You keep nibbling all day, chasing the carbs, trying to stay alert. The current state of our economy adds to job stress even more. We've had to lay off uh, firefighters, um, a little over 50 firefighters. And, and any time you lay off one, uh, it's a blow to the organization. And when you've laid off over 50 over the course of three years, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it demoralizes the organization. It stresses the organization. Uh, you have to, you know, re, um, reevaluate what stations are open, you know, what stations can be closed. We have this brownout matrix uh -huh. that for stations that we brown out, and um, you know, it depends on what staffing level we're at as to which ones get browned out. Last shift, the engine here ran 32 calls. Um, yesterday it ran 32, and the day before it ran 32 calls. Uh, usually a pretty busy day is 12 calls, so we're running, yeah, we're running pretty thin. You know, with the way things are going in the city, number one, there's no time to work out. Number two, you know, the, the, there's just a political climate. They don't want to see you doing anything except for fire-related stuff. And then there's this idea that working out is not fire-related. Our idea is that hey, you have to be strong to do the job, um, cardiovascularly fit to do the job, and it actually costs less to have strong, fit firemen than to have guys that, that aren't that way. But it's, it's a public relations thing right now. There's a variety of physiological, emotional, and I would say environmental factors uh, that really impact policing and, and those out there that have to do that job every day and night. When your blood pressure is high and um, you're not doing things to, to, to relieve yourself of that stress, um, that, those are the, the issues that can compile and build up and before you know it, catch up to you. I'm a naturopathic medical doctor. That's my background. Um, that's where I came from before I got into the, the fire service. So my approach to health has always been prevention. I really believe strongly that not one form of training is right for everyone. Um, so I get really frustrated in trainers or um, um, websites or media that pushes this is the diet for everyone or this is the workout for everyone. There is no one way um, and there is no single right way. It's finding out what's right for you um, and looking at you and your body as that unique animal that you are and finding the diet and the exercise program that works with that unique animal. Just moving, just incorporating movement into your life, I think is the number one thing that we can do to prevent disease and to make a difference in cardiovascular health and prevent uh, potential future heart attacks or MIs.
it's not like we go to a scene and we're able to pick something up that's hooked to cables, yeah. you know, yeah. or that has a correct amount of weight on each uh -huh. side. Uh -huh. So the whole thing that we do here is try to get the body to adapt to uneven surfaces, an unstable, environment. unstable environment. And it's all about the core. Boy. So if we can do this in an environment that's safe and a little bit more predictable, and we can prevent that core injury, that low back injury. We're going to extend the life of that firefighter or that cop. Feels all right. Feels good. <laughs> now, life is an athletic event. And, and when you're in a job that demands physical performance, um, you're like that relief pitcher in life um, every day. We don't know when we're going to have to perform. But when we have to perform, it's not about winning or losing a game. It's about someone winning or surviving or losing their life. So for us, we're the ultimate athletes. And we have to live every day of our lives like we're athletes. So we have to eat right. We have to feed the, the engine. We have to feed our bodies appropriately. Um, and we have to prepare them to be able to function. Next, Chief Hernandez is up for a different way of assessing his risk a carotid artery test. Do you know anything about the test that I'm going to do? Tell me all about it, Doc. Okay. Uh, carotid IMT is an ultrasound exam of your carotid artery that looks at the thickness of the innermost layer of your carotid artery. The carotid artery is the main artery that supplies blood to the brain and to the face. It splits up near the jaw into internal carotid that goes inside the brain and external carotid that goes to the face. Wherever there's a Wherever you see a split or a turn, blood tends to accumulate plaque. IMT has been found to be very important to change people's risk category. In other words, change them from low to intermediate risk or change them from intermediate to high risk. And I think that's one of its main values. You can also determine what's called a vascular age. And that is what age person has the IMT value that you have. So in, with Mr. Hernandez, his uh, IMT was 0.644 millimeters, which happens to be the average thickness of somebody who's 50 years old. Emphasizing lifestyle is probably really important. Putting him on medication maybe is not as important unless his values are really, really abnormal. I think it's a good way to look at somebody to say who really needs to be treated aggressively. We realized, uh, oh gosh, after a couple of years that uh, that were, there were a number of very important variables and all of them had to be addressed. And um, we, came to, uh, we came to a point where we began to describe them as a, as a triangle with the therapeutic lifestyle issues on the bottom of the triangle. One of them was nutrition and another one was exercise. In the middle of the triangle, there's the behavioral component that affects nutrition and exercise and the medical component and at the top was risk assessment and the medical component. And all of those elements need to work together if you're going to have a comprehensive and effective primary prevention program. That's our belief. I'm the chairman of the workers comp program and within uh, the workers pact uh, program, Specialty Health uh, came up with a program to try to minimize the cost, the financial impacts of heart and lung uh, claims for our law enforcement. And uh, I'm a certified public accountant uh, in, my, in my job. I was motivated by, by the dollars. We've got to get an effective program to help these cops. Um, the other side of it is, is that uh, a lot of those cops were my personal friends. And then when one looks in the mirror and I looked at myself, and I, I too had a problem. You know, I had some of the same challenges that my friends in law enforcement had. I was overweight. You know, I wasn't as active. Well, I remember the first time I saw Alan's uh, uh, chart. I, we were in the clinic uh, out in Fallon, and he came in. He was one of the last patients of the day. And then I looked at his chart, and I saw an extremely high triglyceride level, uh, a low um, HDL level, and I saw all the markers of metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome is a cluster of five different findings. Um, the first one is abdominal obesity in men, a waist measurement of greater than 40 inches in women, a waist measurement of greater than 35 inches. Uh, a triglyceride level of greater than 150 would be the second finding. 
An HDL cholesterol of less than 40 in men, less than 50 in women would be the third finding. A systolic pressure of over 130, a diastolic pressure of greater than 85, and then a fasting glucose of greater than 100. If a patient has any three of those five, we make the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. And the reason that's so important is that once we've made that diagnosis, the risk of heart attack doubles and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes increases by a factor of five. So I was intrigued by the program, you know, probably lured at first by trying to help out others and then realizing perhaps I need to help myself. One of the catchphrases that I, I can recall is, uh, as Greeny said to me, he says, you know, we're going to treat you like an athlete. And I thought, you know what, Greeny's right. You know, if, if, if you work out like an athlete, if you take a mentality like that, you know, good things will happen. So through this program and through the education, I learned some of my weaknesses. Uh, you know, uh, I drank a lot of soda. I ate a lot of fast food. Uh, because of my desk job and the stress and stuff, I had a sedentary lifestyle. How yeah. much Mountain Dew were you drinking at, at the most? Oh, at the most, I was probably drinking, um, you know, tw a 12-pack, if you will. And I, and I jokingly say that if, if soda, oh, a day, a day. Oh. So I was buying um, the liter bottles, yeah. and, and I could drink uh, three to four of those a day. I was drinking more calories than I was physically consuming um, during, you know, before I jumped on board in that program. Uh, I, I've never got back to that stage of drinking that much, but um, you know, drinking two, two liters, um, that's my, that was my Achilles heel. All that Mountain Dew Alan drinks contributes to his insulin resistance. When Specialty Health first saw Alan in 2005, his annual physical showed a triglyceride level of 565. That is almost five times higher than normal. People who are insulin resistant and secreting lots of insulin in order to prevent the glucose going up, that insulin will act on the liver and the liver will then make more triglyceride. More triglyceride will come out of the liver and this will contribute to increased risk of heart disease. The whole thing with you are these sugars. If we can control those sugars, all these numbers are so reversible. That's the whole deal with you. It's just not more complicated than that. That's the key for you. Your ability to improve insulin resistance by lifestyle changes, exercise and diet is profound. So not only is it important to recognize, it's one of the things that are easiest and most likely to be able to be improved by changing how you live. So I jumped on board got the religion, uh, listened to the different programs that were going on, and um, you know, I, I dedicated myself as an athlete would to make this work. And uh, you know, within that process, uh, I lost 45 pounds. My uh, numbers uh, came, uh, the red lights, green lights, and uh, yellow lights changed. So you lost 45 pounds yep. over, and it, it wasn't that hard, was it? Once no, it once I, once I was on the program, it was not that hard. When I quit drinking soda, when I quit eating fast food, and I get more exercise, I start seeing good results, and, and same on my blood test. Risk factors are reversible. And then comes the challenge. You know, I took action, was successful, and then slowly started making perhaps bad choices. Uh, you know, I quit drinking soda, quit drinking Mountain Dew, um, well, maybe I'll have one. And unfortunately, um, carrying as of this morning, because I checked 40 of them back. When a person like Alan is struggling, it's not because he's weak or stupid. He's anything but that. Uh, he's a brilliant man. Um, but genetically, he is carbohydrate intolerant. About a year after that, um, I got back on the, pro on the program or kind of dedicated myself again and um, never quite got to where I wanted to be. And, and today, today it's been a yo-yo back and forth. We've been at this game for, what, six years? This is, this is a common problem. This is this, the relapsing nature of this process is... Uh, is so common. I've been, uh, put forth a challenge.
I go through phases where I get motivated, fired up, jump on board. But I've, for whatever reason, I haven't quite found that uh, that that success of maintaining the program to make that complete commitment to a lifestyle change. Alan called us addicted to sugar. Um, if you take a look at his um, his first Big Five chart, uh, he is in the obese range. Um, he had a, a poor anaerobic threshold. Um, he had LDL particles that were too high. His HDL was too low. His triglycerides were high, and it put him into a um, insulin resistance score of 7.5, which is extremely high. We treated Alan with. Um, with diet and exercise and felt like all these things would improve. When you look at all of the risk factors together and you look at his Framingham score, what you see is that had you looked at uh, Framingham alone, he would have been at very low risk. His Framingham ATP3, he would have been at a little bit higher risk, but it was a moderate risk. When we look at insulin resistance, he's very much at risk. So we knew that Alan, Alan definitely had to be treated in the program. He could have been missed. Um, even though he was consuming a lot of Mountain Dews, most family practice doctors would say go home and lose weight. Um, and you can do that by uh, decreasing the Mountain Dews and exercising. We were a little bit more stringent with that. We followed, we followed him carefully and put him on a strict exercise program and, um, and nutritional program. You can change your risk by changing behavior. Alan's charts are a perfect example. But as Alan struggles to change his behavior long term, he also exemplifies what remains the biggest mystery of all. How do you change behavior? Our healthcare system is based on crisis intervention. If you go to a cardiologist, the cardiologist is going to look at this and treat a crisis. And they generally don't get the patient until it's too late, right. um, until they already have a problem. If you go into a primary care doctor's office, their reimbursement has been cut so low that they have to see so many patients a day just to pay the bills that they don't have time to spend looking at uh, going deeper into looking at the, the patient and their, and their problems. So there are a number of factors that this evolve. Requires, this it, requires a new way of thinking. Well, it's a if preventative gonna, way of if thinking. You're gonna, if you're going to incorporate an exercise program and a nutritional program and a behavioral program and do a risk assessment and do advanced testing, you almost have to have a new separate program well, because you're exactly right the medical system that we live in today is not set up to deal with these type of problems comprehensively we're seeing insurance companies that will pay for certain portions of prevention but rarely will unless you have diabetes will they pay for um, nutrition how crazy they won't, is that they won't pay for fitness evaluation and so for for us to put a program together a comprehensive program with nutrition with fitness with behavioral management and with risk assessment the only thing that insurance company will pay for is the risk assessment and so that's the way the system is built in america although everybody touts that they want to look at prevention they're still looking at it from a crisis look, a point of view the Donna's office she did they had a little computer that uh, their uh, She's not overweight, blood pressure looks great, she's not a smoker, she's very fit um, uh, based on aerobic capacity. Um, but when you look at her cholesterol, she has very high cholesterol and in, in multiple areas. I had uh, 72, 73 now, has had high cholesterol I think as long as they've checked it. I've had it since the first time they checked it, even when I was very, very active and very, very fit. And then I have a 15 year old son who recently had his checked, and he is, you know, plays three sports and, you know, 6'2 and 140 pounds. Right. And, you know, the epitome of active. Right. And uh, his cholesterol was close to, you know, high 300s. Heart disease is caused by a number of different factors, one of which is high cholesterol, probably the most important of which is high cholesterol. And um, uh, so in her, that's the thing is that it's not, she doesn't have high cholesterol because her 
lifestyle is poor, she has it because of her genetics. When these things were recognized, um, uh, a recommendation was made and she began treatment with a cholesterol lowering medication. If you look at the numbers, um, her cholesterol was 361, her LDL, which is her bad cholesterol, is 279, and her triglycerides were 213. Um, and so despite the fact that she was eating right, exercising, and trying to stay healthy, she still has substantial abnormalities. But when we did um, her advanced cholesterol test, um, after she had been uh, taking a cholesterol-lowering medication, she had a very substantial improvement. Her LDL cholesterol has come down to 116. Um, her triglycerides are now normal, and her total cholesterol has come down to 206. I don't remember a time that my cholesterol has been under 250. I mean, it's been as high as 505, 485. Some people, um, lifestyle is not enough. It's no different from uh, someone who has a family history of high blood pressure or maybe diabetes, is that, you know, our genetics influence these things, and despite our best efforts sometimes, we need help in some areas, and that's, that's good medicine. I first had a check when I was in college, and I was a college athlete and very committed to working out and uh, had it checked, and it was 385. Um, and then I started my path of thinking that doctors had lost their mind. When Dr. Greenwald in our meeting talked about the ping pong balls versus, and I had, had talked about cholesterol forever, I'd seen a lot of doctors, and I tried to ask, and I guess I didn't verbalize it well, can you just tell me whether this is affecting me, whether I am a risk factor now, regardless of my number, is there something else that you can look at to tell me whether this cholesterol for this long has made an impact on me? And I really would hear back, no, not really. Um, and that was the first time I heard, no, there's more tests we can do. We can see a little bit more about what these cholesterol numbers mean to your risk factor. And I actually stopped the class and raised my hand and said, you got to be kidding me. I've been asking this for a long time. Why didn't somebody tell me this before? It's hard to stay committed to something that you, you're not really certain is going to hurt you because you don't know, you're not very educated about it. And I certainly didn't want to take the drugs when I was pregnant. I didn't want to take them when I was breastfeeding. If there's something else going on, I didn't. Um, and, you know, now I see the effect of them, and I also understand a little bit more about cholesterol and what it does to you. I have an idea of the type of cholesterol I have. I've usually been pretty good about lifestyle things, but I've really re-engaged in that a lot more. I'm on like a three or four different uh, drugs now, one of them being niacin, which can be sort of a pain if anybody's taken it with the flushing and that kind of stuff. This is Kim Bratch. I'm a sergeant with Renal PD. How are you? It influenced a little as I worked in homicide for three years, so you read all the death reports. And sadly, you read a lot that you spend five minutes on and you very quickly write off as a natural death women and men that are my age and that uh, you know have a heart attack and so you start reading enough of those and you go oh geez maybe I ought to find an answer to this. Males tend to get heart disease at a younger age but there's once once ladies hit menopause and their hormones change their actual incidence of heart disease is much higher than males or the effect of heart disease is much more than males. And so we've, there have been national efforts to try and change the perception about um, heart disease and, 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 and uh, the fact that it really doesn't matter what gender and, and, and we've got to be aggressively watchful and vigilant in both. Oh, Kim Bradshaw is a wonderful case to look at. And this is why not, we can see patterns in people, but this is, um, her pattern is very genetically driven. All of her lipid tests come out red lights across the board. And I think that I would point out that um, the LDL particles are 279. That is way high. Um, her HDL is, is low uh, for a female. Her triglycerides are very high. Therefore, what happens is, is when you uh, look at the HDL and the triglycerides, she's, she has insulin resistance. Her Framingham score is at 3%. So even though she has all these red lights, if you were looking at Framingham alone, you would miss the fact that she really needs to be treated by medications. She's very fit and she needs some dietary changes. You would miss that. Her ATP3 Framingham score is two, which is not very high. That's very moderate risk. And so you wouldn't be concerned about her. Uh, but then when you look at her insulin resistance score of being 5.5, you're going, well, we need to take a little bit deeper look. Her small LDLPs were actually um, 
fairly good. And so we know that we could treat her with medication. But I think the most interesting thing about this case, being genetically driven, doctors did not know how to treat her, and doctors didn't know the answer. We hope we have her on the right track. Two weeks after recommitting to the program, Alan has been hitting the gym. I've been through this program of slipping and falling, and, and uh, you know, our new rebirth, uh, regeneration. Uh, you know, I got to get back on the program because uh, when I do exercise, I do feel a lot better, and uh, and I enjoy working out, uh, enjoy going to the gym. Uh, I keep telling myself, it's yeah, you're busy at work, you're stressed. There's a lot of stuff going on, but just like in elementary school, you always love to go outside for recess. You need to go to the gym, go to recess. So when you get I get done doing that, I get invigorated, and, uh, and I feel good. And now that I'm back on the program, I'm starting to see results again, and uh, that's really positive, and, and it keeps me motivated. Now, as far as the sugars and the sweets, uh, you know, that's the hard part. Um, you know, staying away from the sodas, uh, you know, as they've told me, I gotta do that, and drinking a lot more water, you know, that's good. Uh, but I still have that urge. I'm not 100% off of it, but I'm doing much better, and, and I feel a lot better. And uh, getting a lot of support from, uh, from my family, uh, from the kids, uh, co-workers. I do f honestly feel that uh, we can prevent a lot of stuff. Um, we need to have the power to get people to buy into it, though. If they don't believe what we're telling them, they're not going to do it. Uh, that's probably the biggest barrier, uh, is getting them to do little things, not think that I've got to go from here all the way over to here to do what they're asking me to do to be healthy. It's not. It's if we can get you from here to here and you start just incorporating little things, eventually you're going to be over here. You're not even going to know it. You just need to do a few little things here and it's going to get you to here. So it's this continuum of, you know what, no, let's just make a couple little changes and now all of a sudden you feel a little bit better and you're a little more active. Now all of a sudden your clothes are fitting a little bit better. Then they start to buy in. If we can get them to just do a couple little things and get them to buy in, then we can take that process and take a couple of little baby steps, and all of a sudden now we're making some big changes. Awesome. That's the key. There he is. Hey, Mike, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. We're going to find out how good you are, aren't we? <laughs> how much uh, weight did you lose? Uh, I went from 236 to uh, 206 pounds, so about 30, 30 pounds. 30 pounds. So you lost more than 10% of your body weight. Yes. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> well... It's, it's just a pleasure to do follow-ups like this. Your particle number has decreased 527 points. That's remarkable. The small, dense, and dangerous particles have decreased from 877 to 103. That's spectacular. So you've lost 774 of the small particles. You're just an incredible example of how lifestyle alone, without any medications, um, can produce dramatic changes. My primary motivation was my family history of diabetes, uh, the fact that um, I was overweight and I just didn't feel good. I, um, you know, I felt bad in the morning getting up, I felt bad going to bed uh, throughout my day. I was tired, uh, I didn't have the energy that I needed to make it through the day. When I got into the program, uh, the first two weeks were a challenge, but once I got past that 14th, 15th day, I started to notice that my energy level was up, uh, I was feeling better. And now that I'm several months, actually over three months into the program, uh, I feel great. It's good to feel good. I've noticed that uh, we, we work together, we're a brotherhood, and, and a lot of guys will, co will come in, hey, we're, we're having fish, we're having chicken. And some guys might complain, but eventually they'll get on and they'll, it, it's, it's slowly starting to catch on. More people are, are starting to work out. Um, more people are eating better. That kind of stuff kind of started happening around here after our, uh, we started going through specialty health and they started actually getting into the nuts and bolts of our, of our blood work. You know? and, I, and I think actually it changed people. It changes their, uh, their way of thinking. And it changed me a little bit. You know, firefighters are very competitive by nature and when they see someone doing something and they see the results and they hear how, um, uh, you know, they hear about the benefits, they of course want to, they want to tag along. And, uh, and then it becomes more of a competition within the station. You know, who's doing, who's who's lost the most weight, uh, whose whose numbers are down in terms of their you know their cholesterol counts. We cannot sustain the rise in healthcare cost without moving to a prevention, looking at lifestyle, looking at diet, identifying risk early, 
we cannot sustain that. It's 17 to 18 percent of our gross national product. That's what health care cost us today. I think chiefs in the fire service, police service, uh, and federal law enforcement and in federal public safety would be, inter would be very interested in improving the uh, wellness and quality of life for their people as a number one priority. As a number two priority, with the economic challenges we face, I think it would be important to look at the numbers you could save. If you can start working on a kid right now that's 25 or 30 years old with a program like this and reduce the number of workman comps claims, all right, related to health, you know, heart, heart attack, stroke, those, those types of things, and diabetes, I mean, like I said before, that's about 1.2 million, at least by Reno standard, a person. I mean, that's a lot of money. Remember, our biggest asset is our personnel. How much money do we spend on maintenance of our engines and our trucks yearly? I think that it's not too much to ask that we spend a little bit of money on our personnel and the equipment that they represent to be able to keep our departments going and prevent, do preventative maintenance program on them like we do our engines and our trucks and our equipment.